If somebody forces rancid food down your throat, you're likely to get a big belly ache. Maybe you'll even vomit it up because your body rejects it and is afraid of ingesting that rubbish. But what if the one who's been feeding you that bad food says you're committing an unpardonable sin if you don't swallow everything on your plate? That's the same as when preachers say you're in danger of scaring away the Holy Spirit and going to hell if you don't swallow every questionable doctrine that they teach. Beware of preachers who look down on you from the pulpit and they have that Mickey Mouse smile plastered on their face permanently and their eyes are glinting as if to say, I got you now, Buster. I'm going to call you out on the sin in your life because I know all about you. They want to put a first-class guilt trip on you and make you feel guilty for being a normal human being with red blood flowing through your veins. If you frown, feel grumpy, or get up on the wrong side of bed one morning, you can frighten the Holy Spirit away, and he'll fly off like a dove that's got somebody after him with a shotgun because you're supposed to smile all the time. You're always supposed to speak in a well-modulated, churchy tone of voice, or you're not a holy person. If you fall short of such perfection and act like a real human being with feelings, You've lost out with God, and you've scared him away for good. Over the years, preachers have gone from one crazy doctrine to another. They used to be totally obsessed with controlling your money. And maybe they still are. But now they're obsessed even more with controlling your inner life and turning you into a religious nutcase with a kick-me sign on your backside. If you were the victim of a serious crime or some other sort of prolonged serious abuse, you're sinning against God if you want justice to come upon your unrepentant abuser. Instead, you're supposed to pray that God lets that skunk into heaven so he can turn heaven into hell. When confronted with numerous passages about God's wrath on the wicked. Preachers inevitably insist that happened in the Old Testament. But when Jesus came, he came to teach people to patiently go on enduring oppression from enemies and that justice is no longer necessary because God has had a change of heart and is much nicer to the wicked than he used to be. But consider the parable Jesus told about the widow who kept pestering an unjust judge to crack down on an enemy who was making her life a misery. The widow wasn't a bloodthirsty bearer of a grudge. She just wanted to live in peace without being threatened by this evil individual. This particular parable is found in Luke 18, 3-8. Notice that Jesus nowhere condemns the oppressed widow because she desires justice. He doesn't say she should go on suffering the abuse and oppression and the mental anguish this man inflicts on her. In the end, the unjust judge got tired of her coming to pester him and he took care of the situation just to get her off his back. Jesus used this parable to teach his followers to be persistent in making their request to God. Furthermore, Jesus concludes it by asking, Shall not God avenge his own people? Yes, he will, and he will do it quickly. And why will he do it quickly? Because God is a just judge, not an unjust judge. One TV preacher I'll call Dr. Spindle, is forever urging people to forgive the meanest 
nastiest abusers even if they don't repent. And why? The same tired old line, there but for the grace of God go you. And Jesus always forgave everybody because they didn't know what they were doing. If we're supposed to automatically forgive everybody on this planet, no matter how nasty and crappy they treat other people, why not forgive Satan and his demons as well and pray to God that God won't hold them accountable? Is Dr. Spindle saying that God should let rapists, child abusers, and mass murderers into heaven even if they don't repent? It's the stupidest, most asinine doctrine that modern preachers have come up with and spend 90% of their time preaching on when they're not thinking about money. Unconditional forgiveness of the unrepentant found nowhere in Scripture. I know for a fact that rotten school bullies who emotionally bully or physically torment helpless fellow students do know what they are doing, and they do it because they know that they'll get away with it. There's just as much chance of them being called out by authority figures and expelled or punished as them getting struck by a moon rock from the planet Mars. Severe bullying is a slow drip of emotional rat poison that eats away at the inside of the victim like corrosive acid. It robs victims of sleep, shatters their self-esteem till it's in the toilet, has them living in a Emotional, continual fear and mistrust of others. Is Dr. Spindle trying to tell us that even if the victim and their family have to struggle for many years to overcome the bad after effects of prolonged abuse, that this makes them more like Jesus? And that the abuser should get off the hook in eternity just like he did on earth? Oh, twinkles! That's just like trying to tell me that if I take a stick and beat my dog till he's so broken he can't walk or even think straight, that I'm making him more like Jesus. And I don't see how that's any different from what these preachers try to convince us God, our Heavenly Father, is like. And then they go and tell us, more or less, that if we don't believe this crap, that we can lose our salvation, lose the love of Jesus, and become a reject that goes to hell. Talked about re-victimization. They're turning the victim who's trying to recover, trying to be everything that they can be after suffering all that, into a worse criminal than the bully. And that kind of a rotten gospel I refuse to swallow because it is rat poison. And it drives many people away from so-called Christianity because they find more sympathy and understanding from people out in the world than they do in the church who are, seem to go out of their way to love the worst sort of people. And the only time they condemn evil is when they put on a military uniform and go fight in other countries those who never did them any harm. I see such an inconsistency there, as well as in the fact that Christians are very tolerant of school bullying and turn a blind eye to it, whether they're parents or teachers, and make excuses for the bullies, but let their kid break a glass in the kitchen or drop a gum wrapper on the floor, and they get their backside beaten, as if they'd committed some unpardonable sin. Another tired old lame excuse that preachers use to excuse the conduct of the wicked is this. Well, there ain't much you can do about it. God gave every person on this planet free will. And the fact that sinners use their free will to rebel against God, there ain't much we can do about it. But if you pray to the Lord, he'll give you the grace to endure it and be patient with it. Hogwash. 
didn't God also give me free will to want to live in peace and security as a worthwhile human being and walk the streets unafraid and unmolested? Didn't he give innocent school children free will to want to go to school to learn in peace and get an education without fear that they'll be torn limb from limb or threatened with a knife or have their hearts broken and their reputation trashed by some scumbag? What about the free will of those who only want to go about their business and be left alone in peace? Another popular comeback from unconditional forgiveness preachers is the story of Stephen who was martyred for preaching about Jesus. Before he died, Stephen prays, Lord, hold not this sin to their charge. And they imply that every case is the same. And, and so preachers take this example of Stephen's and twist it to make a law saying that all Christians are under some kind of a law that forces them to automatically forgive every unrepentant abuser, no matter how much pain and suffering they have inflicted on them and their loved ones, and how far down the timeline they're still cleaning up the fallout and the repercussions of the abuse. Consider how Stephen ended up. Right after he was martyred and drew his last breath, he was immediately ushered into the sweet presence of God and was happy forevermore. But what if Stephen had barely survived that terrible stoning and lived? But instead of recovering fully, he was left unable to control his bowels. He was unable to eat properly. He was left dribbling at the mouth and totally crippled, would he go on feeling warm and forgiving toward his enemies? Unconditional forgiveness preachers make everything sound so easy. What if their loved one had been tortured and hurt by abusers? Would they be so free and easy about dispensing easy forgiveness the way they do toward other people's hurts. Jesus recorded words, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, appear in Luke 23:34, And these words appear only in the book of Luke, not in the other three Gospels, which is interesting. Biblical scholars are uncertain whether Christ really did say those words, because some manuscripts don't carry those words and even if Jesus did say father forgive them for they know not what they do a minor point conveniently overlooked by unconditional forgiveness preachers is Jesus qualified this forgiveness because they know not what they do the meanest and most malignant criminals do know what they are doing they're shaking their fist in the face of a righteous God as they destroy creatures who are made in His image. And they expect fully that Christians will turn the other cheek because they feel that they have to. And they aren't afraid of any retribution from God or from man. That's why they do it. They do know what they're doing. So they are not entitled to automatic forgiveness. Read Luke 19 Verse 27, in this parable, Jesus compares himself with a ruler who is returning, but his citizens refuse to acknowledge his kingship and submit to him. They will not have him to rule over them. So what does the returning ruler do? He says, bring these fellows in front of me and kill them. This doesn't sound like unconditional forgiveness to me. There is far too little fear of God in this world and even in the church. They have turned the Lord of hosts into the Lord of tea and toast. 
In Exodus 34, 7, God told Moses he would by no means acquit the guilty. Only after repentance and faith in Christ does God take a sinner out of the guilty category. Becoming a believer changes a person's status from wicked to righteous. A stubbornly unrepentant abuser is not a true believer in Christ. God still sees that person as guilty and will not let him off the hook. So he is still under the shadow of God's wrath as John 3.36 teaches. This principle of faith can work both ways. What goes up can come down. Paul taught that we stand by faith and sin brings forth death. A teenager can get swept up in some revival meeting at his church and come to Christ. A few days later, he can buckle under the peer pressure at school and join in when a crowd of bullies beats up the new kid at school for being different in some way. He loves his bad buddies so much, he shuts his ears to the Holy Spirit's plea for him to repent. That kid loves his sins way too much, far more than he loves Jesus. Even if that kid spends his whole life going to church so he'll stay a respectable member of the community, as long as he remains in the devil's service, God sees him as a hypocrite who's on his way to hell. In Luke 12, 45 and 46, Jesus warns that any servant of his who beats up on vulnerable people and acts like a hypocrite will get a hypocrite's reward and be cut to pieces and he would be cast into outer darkness and so that wicked scoundrel who crushed vulnerable people and turned them into outcasts becomes an outcast himself instead of being good soldiers of the cross unconditional forgiveness preachers are panty-waist sissies who tolerate evil in their society and make countless excuses for the wicked. Funny, but I can't imagine that when Jesus comes back to rule over planet Earth, he'll coddle criminals who commit rape, school and workplace bullying, street crime, domestic violence, and protection racketeering. Pacifist preachers don't give a hoot about children being threatened and beaten up and driven to suicide as they try to learn in schools. They don't care about wives who are being regularly beaten by drunk husbands. Their only concern is that the victim always and unconditionally and forever forgive. Hogwash! Hate crimes are tolerated in so-called Christian societies because Christians associate God with being a passive, tolerant, soft old grandfather who doesn't care that these things are going on. And such stupid ideas are a stench in the nostrils of an almighty holy God. Evil proliferates in this world because Christians have ceased to be salt and light in a world full of gross darkness. They oppose legislation which would protect school children from bullies because it would also protect gay students who they feel should be punished with harassment. They look down on divorced women, even those who ran away from violent husbands who could have killed them. All these people preach is forgive, forgive, forgive. I won't 
quote one objectionable word in this quotation, but one black human rights activist said something like this as bigots were threatening him and his people. Too much love. Too much love. Nothing kills a black person like too much love. Aside from the fact that unlimited patience and tolerance of evil gives rise to more evil and causes it to grow in the earth like a fungus and take over society completely because no one stands up to it, the biggest problem I can see with unconditional forgiveness is this. It makes people feel morally superior to God because while God, when he took offense at how he was treated back in the Old Testament especially, he would often punish people with plagues or put them to death even for such sins as picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. While we, as lesser creatures, weak human beings, are obligated to forgive each and every horrible offense perpetrated against us, each and every outrage inflicted on us by some creep which might leave lasting scars and repercussions. This in all likelihood, gives rise to a thought like this, even if it isn't voiced. Well, God doesn't have to do this. God can get angry as much as he wants to. He doesn't have to forgive sins unless somebody repents of them. While he expects me to, that just isn't fair. I must be better than God because I'm held to a higher standard. After many years of inner turmoil resulting from this unconditional forgiveness doctrine and needless guilt feelings for my inability to excuse those who left a big mess in my life, I finally found peace because now I realize it's God's anger I sense deep down inside not my own. I told the Lord it's not my place to carry such a burden or do anything about it. If you're upset with these unrepentant souls, whether they are living or dead, you take vengeance on them because that's what you promised in Romans 12:19. It's not my place to do anything about it, so I turn the job over to you where it belongs. It says in Nahum 1, 2 that you reserve wrath for your enemies, not unconditional forgiveness. If scriptures are translated correctly and to be believed, those are your thoughts and views on how the wicked should be treated. You made the rules. I didn't. So you go and enforce them. I thank you that I don't have that responsibility. It's a terrible one. Jesus prayed, let God's will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Is it God's will to tolerate evil and violence in heaven and make excuses for the perpetrators? It's an offense against God to associate him with a puke-stocking doctrine which ignores evil and puts guilt trips on those who want to see laws passed against school bullying and other evils that get swept under the carpet. Jesus and John the Baptist warned sinners to flee from the fierce wrath of Almighty God, and that sinners had better repent. All modern preachers seem to tell these sinners is God loves them, no matter what they do. And no decent Christian will dare to object to the destruction they leave in other people's lives. And the only ones who ought to feel guilty and ask God's forgiveness are the innocent victims who have the gumption to take a stand against the devil and his evil works. God deliver us all from gutless gospels of guilt. Thank mm-hmm. you.